It's a plot straight out of a spy novel. A presidential candidate in the heart of Europe is stricken by a mystery poison that disfigures his face and nearly kills him. But this is no fiction. It's the story of how Ukraine's new president triumphed over his country's authoritarian rulers while leading a massive people power revolution. Tonight, for the first time since his inauguration, Viktor Yushchenko tells his incredible story to CNN's Christian Amanpour on assignment for 60 Minutes. In Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, the walls of St. Michael's Monastery of the Golden Domes resonate with a painful history. Demolished by Stalin's henchmen, this 12th century cathedral has been rebuilt from scratch, a task almost as monumental as the one faced by Ukraine's new president, Viktor Yushchenko. On the day of your election, you prayed at the cathedral. Are you awed by the responsibility that's put on your shoulders now? Yes, it's a huge responsibility. Ukrainians have dreamt of being free for centuries, so no one expected would come so close to dictatorship. And that might have happened if the plot to poison Yushchenko had succeeded. As it is, it has completely disfigured him. You challenged people about your face. You said that your face is the face of everything that's wrong with Ukraine. What do you mean by that? People cry when they see my face. But my country has also been disfigured. Now we'll bring both back to health. How do you deal with, with this now as a man? This Yushchenko I'm still not used to. This is what Yushchenko looked like only six months ago when he began his campaign to unseat Ukraine's authoritarian rulers by returning home to seek his mother's blessing. When you started in this idyllic, traditional moment, did you have any idea that it would be so tough? I know what kind of country I live in and who is in charge of the government, but I didn't think they'd be cynical enough to poison me. Ignored by Ukraine's highly controlled media, Yushchenko's grassroots campaign against government corruption was somehow starting to catch on. He barnstormed the country with his American-born wife Catherine often at his side. He was a great threat to the old system, to the system where there was a great deal of corruption, where people were making millions if not billions. Catherine, whose Ukrainian parents emigrated to Chicago, was used to straddling two worlds, but nothing prepared her for Ukraine's poison politics. It's something out of an Agatha Christie novel, though, isn't it? The whole purpose of what they did, I believe now, was to keep him out of the campaign, to, to knock him out. They tried to destroy him politically, and I always feared when they were not successful that they would try to then do something physically. And look at these lovely children, all in orange. I must say, this is a symphony. <laughs> Deep in my heart, I very much feared that something would happen to our entire family. And then suddenly it did. On September 6th, Yushchenko fell critically ill, and no one in Ukraine could explain why. It was a very, very, very difficult situation. Many of the doctors told us that they were, that they just had never experienced somebody having so much pain for so many unknown reasons. He had symptoms such as a swollen pancreas, stomach ulcers, and a crippling backache. Yushchenko's family rushed him to this clinic in Austria. But Dr. Michael Zimfer was just as baffled by his seemingly unrelated symptoms. That made us suspicious. We informed the patient that we never saw an identical clinical picture before, and we suspect that there might be an act of bioterrorism or of poisoning behind that. The doctors struggled to save his life, but they couldn't keep him in bed for long. Eight days later, Yushchenko insisted on going home, with tubes dripping painkillers inserted right into his spine. 
Did you ever try to dissuade him? My husband is not a man you can dissuade. He knew he had to go forward, and there was no turning back. Three days after returning to Kiev, Yushchenko faced down his political enemies in parliament. They had mockingly attributed his mystery illness to bad sushi or excessive drinking. But no one could explain why his face was so horribly swollen. Look at my face. This is a fraction of the problems I've had. And it's not a problem of cuisine. We're talking about the Ukrainian political kitchen, where assassinations can be ordered. You know very well who's the killer. It's the government. But the government brushed off these allegations until the hard proof came in. Three months after Yushchenko first fell ill, this lab in Amsterdam reported dioxin levels in his blood 6,000 times above normal. Dr. Bram Brouwer runs this lab. This is the highest we've ever seen, and uh, also one of the highest that's ever reported. And it fits very well with the symptoms that are now observed uh, at Mr. Yushchenko's face, the, 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 the chloracne. The evidence that Yushchenko was poisoned was now irrefutable. Dioxin, one of the world's most toxic chemicals, was responsible for scarring his face and threatening his future with cancer. But the question remained, who carried out this crime? The attempt to eliminate Yushchenko is as Byzantine as Kiev's skyline, filled with plots and potential villains. One theory is that he was poisoned by Ukraine's security services, the old KGB. Because just before he fell so gravely ill, he had been invited to dinner by the security chiefs. Yushchenko and his hosts had shared crayfish, salad and a few beers. And ironically, they had been meeting to discuss the death threats against him. Ukraine's security services deny they had anything to do with the poisoning. Their director had in fact been helping the Yushchenko camp. Mr. President, do you know who did this to you specifically? I have no doubt this was done by my opponents in the government. That's who would benefit the most from my death. But there is still the mystery of how it was done. One way to solve it is to trace the poison. Do you have any idea where the dioxin came from that poisoned you? Some people in your camp think that it came from a Russian chemical weapons lab. Dioxin like this is produced in four or five military labs in Russia, America and few other countries. Our security services have informed me how this material got into Ukraine. But that evidence is now with our general prosecutor, who eventually must answer this question. They must also examine another plot on his life. Ukraine's security services say a powerful car bomb targeting Yushchenko's headquarters was discovered during the presidential campaign and two Russian nationals are being interrogated. Spokesmen for Russia's security services would not comment on either case. But President Putin's role during the election remains controversial. He openly backed the hand-picked successor of the previous regime, coming to Kiev twice to lend his support. President Putin supported your opponent during the election. How do you reconcile with him? I'll give him my hand and say, Vladimir Vladimirovich, let's forget the past and think of the future. This week he did just that, greeting President Putin on his first trip abroad since his inauguration. Everyone now understands only Ukrainians have the right to choose Ukraine's president. Our president is not elected in Moscow or anywhere else. That became apparent when the previous regime tried to steal the presidential election through massive voting fraud. It triggered what became known as the Orange Revolution, a spontaneous revolt of outraged citizens who for weeks besieged their own capital. Democracy was finally taking root 
in a country where greed and corruption had become the rule of law. When government troops lined up for what could have ended in a European-style Tiananmen Square, the people's power of persuasion won the battle of the streets, and Yushchenko and all those who had believed in him triumphed in a bloodless revolution. The millions who came out on the streets showed they don't want tyranny, they want freedom. At what price that freedom? Yes. Everyone has paid a price. A lot of people asked me, how did you deal with it? And my answer was always, my husband's alive. My children are alive. I'm alive. It was such a small episode in a huge revolution. Generations of Ukrainians, you could say centuries of Ukrainians, have dreamed and have fought and have died for at the chance to be right where we are right now. When I heard that millions were praying for me, it went straight to my heart. But I also felt an obligation to live. To die is not very original. But to live and carry on, that's special.